Hi and welcome to London Lens TV. I've got something slightly different for you all this afternoon. This afternoon, whenever you're watching, morning, afternoon, evening, um, I've got Robert sitting here uh, by himself. Hi, this is Robert Bradley. He is the lead actor in um, Joe Strummer Takes a Walk. I'm really excited about this interview because it's very different. Usually, as you guys know, people who watch London Lens TV, we usually interview, we, it's only me, we usually interview bands and artists but I really wanted you guys to know about this because I came to see this show a couple of weeks ago and I was blown away. So, Robert, welcome to London Lens TV. I'm Thank so excited much. to have you on. I'm excited to be here. And sorry that I was an hour late. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, punk rock is always going to start late. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> at least you didn't spit at me. <laughs> Let's see how it goes. <laughs> oh, God, I'm scared. <laughs> so, uh, before I started rolling the camera on my little iPhone, uh, advertising iPhone, all other phones available, <laughs> might I add, <laughs> before I started rolling. We were having a chat about um, how you got into acting and uh, some of the things that you've done. So yeah. should we pick that up? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, as I was just explaining, I, I got into acting and in theatre kind of the long way round. I did a bit in school like lots of people do. It wasn't until I was at uni, I started doing student theatre, which, I mean, was absolutely ramshackle, held together with <laughs> gaffer tape and dreams. Oh, love it, love it. It was, it was great. And, you know, looking back on those, those great days of doing all those wonderful parts in student theatre where you're playing these big, big things and you're like, oh, this is great, we're all going to be actors. And then someone, then you hit reality afterwards. Yeah. Um, so I came down to London to, to train, got a scholarship to train in one of the drama schools down here. Which one? Uh, Mount View Academy. Oh, Mount Theater View, yeah. yeah. That's, a, that's a great bit. It's I was the winner of the Sir John Mills Scholarship in 2009. Um, and I've been down ever since, working wow. mainly in theatre, um, lots of voiceover, I've done some film and TV, um, worked in voiceover for video games as well, which is such a giggle. Yeah, Such a giggle. But yeah, uh, every once in a while I get to do an incredible job in theatre, and this is definitely one of them, taking on one of the most iconic characters in, in all of music history. Yeah. It's crazy. And you did an amazing job, but we'll go into that in a minute. Um, so I was doing a bit of research. I came across the I came across Joe Strummer takes a walk because I'm into theatre. I also, of course, I'm a punk rocker. No, I, I mean I don't wear the uniform. No tattoos over here. But um, <laughs> um, but I came across it through a ticket a ticketing web website, and I don't know if I would have heard of it otherwise. But anyway. Um, so I was doing some research over the last few days, and this has been a long time coming, right? They have been working on this for a while. So the origin of the play, um, the writer Juan Alberto, Juan Alberto Silviete, who's a Spanish uh, playwright, he won a competition in Spain with his play, Joe Strummer Takes a Walk, uh, all written in Spanish. Um, Jorge de Juan, who is the artistic director of the Cervantes Theatre and the director of this piece here, um, was part of the judging panel, read the play and went, this is great, we, we should put it on. Um, the Cervantes Theatre here in London, their remit, their mission is to bring Spanish writing to the London stage. And more often than not, their productions then have two casts, one who speaks Spanish, one who speaks English, and they rotate them through the week. With this play, what they did is something slightly different. Once they translated it into English, the writer himself realised that this is where it needs to be its first incarnation. So although there's always ambitions for the play to go on and, and migrate and use it, the, the copies of the, the play script that you can buy in the Foy are all both in Spanish and English. Right. So you can see the original text. This is a first production they wanted to keep in English, in the language of Joe Strummer. And our translator, uh, Lauren French, did such an amazing job of bringing across lots of those aphorisms and idioms and just the way of speaking that kind of, kind of brings it and migrates it into that way. And then the additional task of us to do this. So we did an online reading back in September last year. And that's the first time I heard about it. Right. But I think Juan Alberto's been working on this for years. And Jorge, who, the director, again, has spent the last year or two trying to bring this to fruition. Yeah. And with everything in lockdown, he kept on telling me, we've got to do it, we've got to do it. And they did. They, yeah. they, the crazy bastard, they did it. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> and, and a wicked job they made of it as well. Yeah. Um, so for people who... Um, you, who, who don't know about the show, what it, about the play, mm. what is it actually about without giving too much away? Because I want people to go and see it. Yes, <laughs> like all good theatres filled with mystery and intrigue as well. Yeah. So basically the play begins uh, in the 18th of August 1985 in Granada in Spain, in the middle of nowhere. Who Joe sings about, where Joe sings about as yeah, well. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> so 1985, The Clash, 
where I think it's fair to say now from this point in history, they were on the ropes. You know, they'd fired Topper, they'd fired Mick, they brought out the album. It just was not be, it was about to launch and was not going to be well received. Joe Strummer knew the writing was on the wall. Yeah. It seems to be the way. And this is real life. This actually happened. 1985, he then just goes away to Granada for a couple of months, comes back and forth between the UK and Granada and New York and back and really starts to fall in love with Granada. He goes out there and the stories around there are unbelievable. He hosts a party for kind of a local group and he just spends most of the night being like the wine waiter and tries to pretend he's not Joe Strummer and people don't recognize him. It's so Amazing. strange, but one of the just things kind of he, thing did, he would do. Exactly, <laughs> trying that big leveler. But one thing he did, and this is what the play picks up on, is Joe Strummer was inspired by many poets, writers over the years. One of which was the great poet of Spain, uh, Federico García Lorca. Um, Lorca, back in the 1930s, went back to Spain when the Spanish Civil War was about to start, unlike a lot of his contemporaries, and tragically was, in the middle of the night, on the 18th of August 1936, dragged from his, dragged from his home along with three other people, taken out into the desert and murdered. Rather, I mean, if you read into it, it's really brutal, by fascist mobs. Yeah. Um, and Joe Strummer was so inspired by Lorca's work and Lorca's life that he decided on the 18th of August, 1985, 49 years to the day of his murder, to go out without any kind of specific directions with his mate, Jesus Arias. They just drive out into the middle of nowhere in the middle of the night and start digging to find his body. And that's where this play begins. And what Juan Alberto has created for us is almost like a what if. What happened that night? Because we know he didn't find the body, or did he? We don't know what happened right. because we don't, we, right. no one to this day still knows where he's buried. So the play is about what happens when Joe Strummer turns up and believes that this is the place and starts digging. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so for those of you who weren't expecting anything quite as brutal as that, um, you know, it's Joe Strummer. You know, <laughs> what else do you expect? <laughs> so how is the playwright connected to Joe? Interesting. So um, uh, uh, Juan Alberto, uh, uh, he was in, I mean, he's been a huge Clash fan all his life. And as I understand it, it's also uh, him and Jorge also know the, the brother of the guy who went with him that night. Right. Jesus Arias, who's also, funny enough, a punk rocker. Right. Had as a punk band in Spain. Oh. Um, and so he, he, once he found this out, he just started reading into it. And of course, I mean, for anyone who goes to Granada, there is, uh, there is Joe Strummer, the Joe Strummer Plaza, Joe Strummer Square. They love him there, the big murals to him. There's like bars, like all the memorabilia. He's huge there. He's always felt a spiritual connection to it. So once he uncovered this kind of story of him going out into the, in the middle of the night and starting digging, suddenly it was just great. He, he read all the books, did all the biographies, found out what he could about that. And then started putting together this idea of kind of melding that surrealist world of Lorca's poetry that Lorca likes to create into this idea of a of a rock star on the ropes, <laughs> yeah. kind of in the, in the kind of autumn of his career, or so he felt, and kind of yeah. putting the two together in this crazy hedonistic mix of kind of punk rock and surrealism. Definitely surrealism for sure. <laughs> I don't want to give anything away, but there's well, there's a moment where I nearly fell on the floor and climbed under my seat because it was a little bit creepy. You know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, so you did a dramatised reading during lockdown. Yeah. Um, how did that come across? Because I couldn't, I, I didn't watch it myself because mm. um, I'm going to watch it later on. Um, but I've already seen the show. So how did that come across on the, was it a live reading that you did? So it was staged as live. So we, um, we the Cervantes Theatre do a series of dramatised readings where they kind of take the play in a written format and within the space of 48 hours, see how much they can put it on as a production. Actors will always have script right. in hand. So, you know, you know that you can see that. And for the online dramatised readings, we used a bit of teleprompt as well, so we can do a bit of visual to camera. But it's really, I mean, it is really rough and ready. Because um, you had two days rehearsal, I understand. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, and by two days, I mean like four hours each day. Right, oh, OK. <laughs> so a day. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Uh, pretty much a day to kind of just throw up whatever we could. Yeah. And that's kind of in the spirit of things. Because with, when it comes to theatre, particularly a new writing, is... Sometimes the quicker you can get it up, the more ideas can shine through, just as a kind of testing bed. And that's all it was designed to do, to give a flavour of what a full production could be like. Okay. And they do these throughout the year. So if you go to um, Cervantes Theatre website, they've got quite a few other plays as well. They've done this too over the last 12 months and beyond as well, but they used to do it live here in the space. 
So the difference between getting a sense of it in two, three days and just getting it up on a long filming day where by the end of the by the end of the filming run, you know, we've been filming for ten hours and I was like wired looking at the camera trying to find the next line. Yeah. And actually having to spend, you know, a proper rehearsal period of a couple of weeks now to kind of get under the skin more of it, find those bits and pieces and change that slight elements of it too to try and find, you know, get to the truth of what it is. It's been really interesting. I can imagine. So for people who don't who don't watch the theatre, so that's a really good insight into how it works. Because um, I know a lot of punks kind of think that the theatre is a bit bourgeois. I love oh. theatre myself. But, um, so you said, you touched earlier on the fact that the play was uh, originally written in Spanish. Cervantes is it, I haven't kind of pronounced it correctly. This is a Spanish theatre, right? This is Spanish theatre, and my pronunciation is as bad as any <laughs> Okay, cool, we're, we're on the right, we're on the same page yeah. then. Um, so what was it that drew you to this role? So you actually play Joe Strummer, right? I played Joe Strummer for, through this, and um, it's a monologue play, so I'm kind of, the only dialogue or the only words kind of come from me effectively, mostly. Um, the, the Cervantes theatre, and um, what drew me to this role is just, the idea of getting one of the things that came really clear at the online reading was I got to spend three days like in that kind of role of Joe Strummer feeling like a rock star and that's amazing yeah. like I am not the rock star <laughs> type I am quiet and shy and retiring of course but like of course, of course. <laughs> like all actors <laughs> exactly but Joe Strummer was a guy who was who's out there projected so hard and then when you understand a bit about his background, his upbringing, how, you know, you read that he was the son of a diplomat, he went to boarding school, you know, all that kind of stuff, he was a hippie and all that, and then he became the punk rock warlord, as he called himself once. So it's such an interesting mix of someone who's shouting so hard about what he's got to say, but deep inside, is that because he maybe doubts it? Or is he completely sold in it? So, you know, taking an interesting character in an absolutely fascinating circumstance because I've like I've done some crazy things in my life <laughs> I have never gone looking for a dead body <laughs> with no direction or had the impetus to just start digging for it but he did and so trying to understand some of that I think is a really fascinating prospect for an actor and what's great about theatre is you get to share that with people you get to let people in on that. So yeah. I get I get to spend a couple of weeks now feeling like I'm a rock star, but I also get to know that with the audience in there and start get that involvement as well, people start to draw into the story too and you can share that with people. Because yeah. that's what punk and theatre, I think, have absolutely in common. Is this idea of you have to share it. Yeah. Theatre doesn't doesn't work in isolation, neither does, neither does punk rock. You've got to get people involved. Absolutely, I totally agree. Um, so were you, a f I mean, everyone's going to be asking this, were you a fan of Joe Strummer, the, um, the Clash, punk rock before? I mean, how could you not okay. be? I'm pretty sure my sister gave me, for, I think it was like my 14th birthday, got me a, a Clash CD for my 14th birthday. And like, again, I, like, I'll quite happily admit, if I had to name my top five bands, the Clash wouldn't have been in there when I was like 14, 15. Right, interesting. Which is funny because I went through, because my musical education was through that 90s, garage band yeah. sounded like the Red Hot Chili Peppers yeah. but then also kind of like British kind of like rage rock like Skunk and Hansi I was big on and like all that kind of yeah. stuff so there was clearly that tradition was there but like everyone who grew up with music there was like music of my time and then just this big nebulous thing of history yeah so they're in the same like I knew the Clash were but in my mind they were the same in the same kind of time frame as the Beatles and the Stones all <laughs> old music yeah and it's only when you kind of start to pick apart all the music you love that you're like it all traces back to that yeah and so sure. this has been a great opportunity to, to do that because of course I, as I grew older kind of those are the songs that keep on coming back yeah you know the Clash's music it just pops up every now and again and every time it does you sit there going it's a fucking banger yeah. every time well not every time not towards the end but <laughs> <laughs> and lots of people will agree but yeah I mean they're in their heyday they they had it um, I'm I'm a massive fan of Mick as well I love Mick Jones oh <laughs> god and he was the, and he was the real deal yeah for, for like for Joe who was pro projecting so hard from like Paul who had like had a bit of like comfort to him as well yeah. Mick Jones was the real deal yeah absolutely love him um, okay, so what is there that you've, you know, with your research and with, you know, um, bringing the role to life and um, getting under the skin, as you said earlier, what have you learned about Strummer that you maybe didn't know before? Quite, I mean, obviously quite a lot with that respect, because he's such a, because he's such a seminal figure in the history of, of music in, in the 20th century, there's, there's no end to how much you can find out. I mean, particularly with the time we had to lead into this from the dramatised reading before and this, 
his biography, but also um, uh, Johnny Green's biography as well. He like the difference between what people say of, of Joe Strummer when they're thinking fondly of him and what someone's actual account of being on tour with him is like yeah. was really, <laughs> yeah. really interesting. But everything from like how how strongly he felt his connection and his roots like through his family, how how much he carried with that that sense of energy that ideal, his kind of almost his flippancy with flavors. Something would be the greatest thing ever yeah. one week, and then like next week's like oh I can't believe you listen to that anymore. Yeah. His fashion of flares, and then it was like never flares again. If you wear flares, you're boring. You're like great. Yeah, um, it's it's so um, it's really is the essence of it's a bit like Johnny Rotten. I probably wouldn't like to be compared, but he's very very similar in that sense so much so and yeah. uh, th there's um the his uh, the, the biography redemption song by john selowitz uh, yeah, yeah really great really goes into such amazing detail particularly around that whole 76 77 period when you know one on ers were finishing yeah. bernie rhodes was making the clash you know the sex pistols were coming up yeah. and then they had that big oh my god they swore on tv and then suddenly <laughs> the clash had all these gigs yeah. so that kind of back and forth and things like that how like the, clearly there was a respect for the work and the respect for each other. I mean, Joe Strummer was one of the first ones to stand up and went, no, they've got something, yeah. they've really got something there. And so kind of, I think there was that kind of camaraderie, but of course then when The Clash got their album out first, and Johnny Rotten was like, oh, well, yeah, they, they, they did, you know, Police and Thieves, oh. You're like, I love that idea. <laughs> yeah. They just had this, like, it was almost that respect camaraderie, but then of course you've got like Sid and Nancy and everything, yeah. just that whole, and, and it's it's great for marketing. John John Lydon's a great marketer, isn't he? Massive. He's brilliant at PR. So, but also the Clash as well. When yeah. they said with CBS, CBS made all kinds of stories about their about there being real friction between the Clash yeah. and the management, which were completely made yeah. up because they wanted that they wanted to keep that authenticity and that authentic that authenticity. I think is one of the big touch points of the whole punk movement in the late seventies. How do you remain authentic? but then sell enough records to make your next one. What exactly. happens when, when you know, the Clash of the Pistols become stratospheric in their success? How can you claim to have that working authenticity? And this is a question that is, is on the punk scene now. To this day, people yeah. are still talking about it. They're sellouts, they're, well, oh, all right, well, you know, they're just, they're just doing what they love, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, in the Q&A after the, um, after the dramatised reading, I'm, I'm going to put the link in the comments. Um, so for anyone who's watching, you can see that as well. I'm hoping it will still be up. Oh, um, so it's the hair I had back then. <laughs> Mid-lockdown, I think I had a ponytail the same last year. Did it? Yeah, did yeah, it? Yeah. I didn't, I could, you couldn't really see. It looked like that you had like a beret on and something. It was a bit of a Citizen Smith <laughs> <laughs> look going on. <laughs> but that might have been the lighting. <laughs> but you talked about um, in that Q&A the challenges that you had as an actor portraying Joe Strummer and... Um, um, and as I've said, you can go and watch that. But I was absolutely gripped. So as you said earlier, it is a monologue with um, with a strange thing that happens uh, alongside that. <laughs> um, I was absolutely gripped. And what I, me and my boyfriend were saying afterwards was to hold an audience for 90 minutes in such a small place um, with you know people who were going to be judging you on so many different levels. We were really, really... Um, we were really... Uh, impressed so but what I wanted to ask was how would you describe uh, Joe Strummer to someone who's never heard of him or knows very little about him ah it's, that's a great one a again it's always about these um, these touch points these references Joe Strummer was someone who in the early to mid 70s and then obviously beyond but when he was right there in the moment knew there was something that needed to be said and What's also quite encouraging from anyone like me who is so not musically minded, he didn't have any formal training as a musician. He barely, I mean, one of the reasons he called himself strummer is because he always says, I play all six strings or none. He can't do any fiddly stuff, he can yeah. just whack away at yeah. it. And so he found a vehicle to make some noise. And that's what it began as. But that's such a, that really is such an important thing, like just for all of humanity. Sometimes you don't know what the exact thing you need to say is. Maybe you've just got a couple of ideas. Joe Strummer was a guy who put that together with a musical movement at the time and absolutely smashed it out of the park. And along the way, he made some fantastic music. But if you, lo if you listen to his lyrics, it shows you how deep that idea of rage can really go. Yeah. Because I think what sets... The, the, what sets the Clash aside and like and the Pistols and quite a few other bands at the time as well 
is the ones that really worked were the ones who could say something with that rage, but that it meant a lot. The lyrics were deep. Yeah. And that's what really people really gripped into. Thank you. Um, so again, going back to that Q&A, the writer talks about, um, about Joe being a character and the challenges writing the script. Um, so how did you and the writer and the director work together to develop this non-fictional character mm -hmm. in a way that felt true to all of you <laughs> and in, also in a way that could be seen as authentic by audiences as well. Yeah, that's it, and that's always going to be a tricky one because, of course, with such a such a celebrated figure, everybody has an idea of him. And of course, the idea of Joe Strummer in 1985 was very different to what he then later became as a kind of elder statesman yeah. figure. I mean, when he then like diversified and loved like you know like new like new wave electro music in the 90s. You know, who he is to each and every single person is going to be different. So within that, we need to find where he is right now. And where he is part is partly based on kind of his story that everyone knows, his famous bio, like things you would read in his biography and like that. But also kind of the play that we have now. In in all of theatre and film and TV, when, when you're looking at a script, you're looking at character through action. What do they do? How do they approach things? What is it they say and feel and think in those moments? Because that's how the character comes out. And part of it is, from my point of view, having to trust the writer. Um, Juan Alberto wrote quite precisely about what kind of Joe Strummer he, that he was envisaging then. And that might not have been how the actual Joe Strummer yeah. would have reacted, but we bring across this idea of him being the big showman in that moment. It's almost like he's at, it feels like he's at a gig with an audience for, for lots of yeah. it. Yeah, for sure. And so we get to step up into that. And so a lot of it's about, a lot of it's about finding what happens in the play and how that character would approach it and linking that to what's on the page because you want to react in certain ways but why is it he reacts like this and if you can find that on stage and do that every night people are going to respond and yeah. then if you can bring across some of that physicality to it that kind of dynamic movement that he does i mean he says in the play you know sings growls dominates the stage yeah. he did that that voice as well he's got that kind of it's, it, he's got that kind of broad upbringing because he grew up in he was born in Turkey he grew up in Mexico West Germany parts of Africa before coming to London so he has this kind of almost nebulous transatlantic voice plus a kind of really heavy Bob Dylan influence yeah. as well in it yeah. and then there's that kind of sardonic kind of way he speaks he sometimes coughs and spits at things with the kind of the way he speaks so it's kind of building that all in without making it a caricature and if you can get all of that together yeah. which is what takes all the time in rehearsal then you've got something people are going to go, oh, I see Joe Strummer there. For sure. And we, I, I definitely did. My boyfriend said, said the same thing, <laughs> said, said the same. Um, what I wanted to ask you as well was what were the, was the moment that you knew that you had the essence of what the writer was trying to tell us? Oh, that's a good question. It, 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 I mean, again, we, 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 when we rehearse, we do it in, you know, with just me and the director or the writer sometimes involved as well or anyone else, the stage yeah. manager too. So there's a whole team that kind of help us put it together in that respect. So you know, I would feel embarrassed to say it was just me because it's not. Yeah. It's a whole team every night. Um, but when it comes to that, we really don't know whether or not that's going to work or not until we add the audience because that's, right. that's when the rubber hits the road. Like, uh, you know, for the weeks that we rehearse, we are just you know, we're strange people saying words that aren't our own in a way that we think will work. Yeah. As soon as we add an audience, we find out. And every night it's a bit of a voyage into the, into the kind of discovery. Because I don't know until I stand up there and say those opening lines, whether or not I'm going to have any kind of impact with this audience, whether or not that's a connection I'm building there. And sometimes you have to work to find those moments and find those things. But in, until you do, you just have to kind of remember and go through that kind of rhythm of building up to that moment, making that as real as possible for me, setting in those default factors of the voice, the movement, the creativity, the ambition. What is it I came here to do? And then just let the events of the play unfold. Because this is honestly, it's as much a surprise to me every night yeah. as it is to everyone else. Because I, I know what the next words I'm going to say are, but I just don't know what's going to happen next. And that's that, exciting. That, that it is, and that's where live music and theatre are so similar. Absolutely spot on. Um. So. If you don't mind answering this question. Uh, <laughs> That's a great start. <laughs> um, 
What did you learn about yourself through doing this pro through this process? Um, I definitely, I definitely found out how much I've been missing live theatre because it's now been like 18, at least eighteen months till since pretty much anyone has had yeah. a live audience, with the exception of brief break over last year, and particularly this moment now in history, the chance to have a play where I get to work with an audience the whole way through it, it's just it feels like such a gift it really does feel like such a gift so I think it's also it's also definitely the most work I've had to do for a play <laughs> right? in a long time <laughs> wow. not just in terms of the, the lines the time but also yeah. kind of like really going to spaces that you know weren't natural fits you know my my own body and physicality is very different to that of Joe Strummer yeah. I can cut my hair all I like but that you know a haircut's not going to convince someone yeah. i've got to really grip and, f and make that work every night um and i probably definitely found out that i that uh, like i it takes me a bit longer to learn lines than i was expecting right <laughs> going into all that so many bits because especially the way we present him was that kind of fragmented style of language and i think that's true to joe strummer if you you know if there's a way of saying something you'll say it four different ways each yeah. one more verbose than the last so you know, getting uh, getting to play with that is fun, but it was also a lot of hard work to remember. What is it? Why does he need another one? Why does he need to say it again? What is it he's hoping to achieve with this next one? So it's it's been a real it's been a real roller coaster for that, and I think I found a lot from it. Amazing. Um, I was just as as a uh, as you were talking there, and you reminded me of of some of the moments that um, that really struck me the other week when I saw the play. But something that my boyfriend was talking about, and it may have been the angle as well, because we were sitting like <laughs> but kind of behind where you are now. We yeah. were sitting up there and uh, you were over here. Is it okay if I show you, the set? Yeah. You right so ahead. you you were over here and um, having a having a conversation with an area over there. <laughs> <laughs> but there was a moment where we both looked over and we looked at your shadow and you actually looked like you could have been Joe Strummer. <laughs> I mean, it was, you know, because you're quite a lot taller than him, I believe. And, <laughs> but it was like, yeah. It's just so, perspective on further away. Well, yeah, but, but, you know, the lighting was just right. And yeah. I think probably the angle was just right, but it was, you know, and, uh, and, and that was when I was like, I've got to tell people about this. <laughs> You know your shadow. I'm telling people about your shadow. A, but there was all of the all that with all of everything else that went yeah. with it. There's a nice kind of sort of um, circularity to it then as well, because effectively Joe Strummer has come to dig up the grave of Lorca. He's looking for ghosts, you know, to yeah. further inspire him. Because I think he would have loved. Because Lorca Lorca met a horrible, horrible end, but he did it for a cause. Yeah. And so in that way, he kind of he definitely sees Lorca as a kind of like a martyr. To a cause, which I think in 1985, Joe Strummer would love to have sacked it all in and become a martyr to something. <laughs> For sure. Absolutely. I'm sure I'm sure the week after you've gone, no, that's a terrible idea. <laughs> yeah. But so in a way, he's looking to conjure some ghosts. And in a way, that's kind of what we're looking to do with the play is yeah. that bring that kind of spirit, that energy, that kind of enthusiasm, that style, so that people can kind of feel a flavour of that. You know, we're never gonna we're never gonna be on stage in front of fifty thousand people like the Clash were. But if we can get a moment, even just a quick moment like that, it can really be quite powerful. Awesome. Um, so there was a question about um, or a talk about you going on tour in that Q and A that you had. Um, do you know if that's going to happen? I have no idea. I'm okay. always the last one to know. The right. Answer, okay. Of course. <laughs> but we always want to talk about where this play would go next. Yeah. I mean, definitely one thing there interested in doing is taking this play and taking it to Granada. Yeah. To Abaitin where kind of where he's referring to in the play in Visnar too. Which, you know, two weeks in, in the south of Spain for a play I'm sure I could find time in the diary for yeah. that somewhere. Yeah. Especially over the next few months, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah, Southwark, Spain. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um so what would you say to theatre goers who aren't punks or no, or you know fans of The Clash or Joe Strummer? Oh it, again this is a chance to see it firsthand, especially if you know, I mean, this thing is this play has such a wide audience and if you know about punk, if you know about The Clash, it's a great chance to, to put that on for a night and see what it does in a kind of theatre context. Because theatre is, I mean, much like punk and live music, is a kind of live, in-your-face experience. Yeah. What happens tonight during the show will never happen again. And seeing something right in front of your face is the difference between watching a gig on, on TV and being there. Absolutely, Such I agree. Such a difference. Yeah. And for those uh, theatre goers who maybe don't know about Joe Strummer, don't know about The Clash, don't know about punk rock, 
it's the perfect opportunity to come in and see that kind of blend of formats. Yeah. To have a little taste. I guarantee anyone who comes to see this show, if they haven't already, they're going to want to go away and listen to a couple of albums when they finish. I would definitely agree. And also it shows what an intelligent guy he was as well. Oh, so... I mean, he loved to talk about everything, anything. He was always the expert in this new thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, bless him. Um, so um, what would you say to punks who consider theatre to be bourgeois? Uh, I would say that a lot of it is. I mean, that's <laughs> just the nature of the beast. But listen, we are not uh, we are not a massive theatre with, you know, £80 a ticket. We're a nice, reasonably priced French theatre. Yeah. Theatre... It's really accessible, this theatre, actually. Yeah, it's yeah. a really lovely space, this, and really functional, too. The um, theatre, especially French theatre in London, is the cutting edge. They, like, you go to bigger theatres and they don't take as many risks as they do in a place like this. Little theatres like this take risks with every single production. And this is where the most creative spaces there are. As long as there has been human civilization, there has been some format in which people get up and tell stories. And it's just yeah. like this. Thousands, tens of thousands of years ago, it was like this just without the walls. Exactly. And long yeah. after any kind of apocalypse scenario, zombie or otherwise, there will be this format. And there's a reason for that. It's because someone getting up and telling you a story as a character is just priceless. And if you want to give your time and effort to a piece of theatre or a story or a poem or a song for however long it lasts, what you get back is a, an exchange of culture you may not even have realised. And that's why it really is one of the most important artistic formats just that has ever existed. And we need more support, right? Oh yeah, right now, <laughs> we need right more now. It's more than it's ever. Now, yeah. more than ever coming back on its feet yeah. as live music is, yeah. as so much artistic medium is right now. We want to be able to share that, and with the theatres mitigation, you know, procedures as well. People want to stay safe. People, some people wearing masks, some people not. And again, we are all in a position where filling theatres, filling venues, is going to be really important for the survival of the format. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. I'm going to go to. Uh, have you got time? Uh, we do another five. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. <laughs> I'm going to go to a quick fire round now. So quick it might fire might round. be four. Might be four right. minutes. <laughs> Let's go for it. Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask you in terms of. Theatre. I usually ask bands and artists oh, in terms nice. of uh, music, but in terms of theatre, um, what's the best show that you have seen as an audience member? Oh, uh, a play called Islands that was at the Bush Theatre in 2014, I think it was, which sounds ridiculous. It was, a, it was, it, it was, it was I, if someone had described this play to me, I would never have gone to see it. Right. It was a um, absurdist based on Italian traditional comedies grotesque imagery usage kind of slightly wow. devised piece about international corporate finance right and okay tax, and tax fraud <laughs> okay. love it already. i would never yeah. yeah i would never had someone described that would never go and see it it was absolutely like head against the wall unbelievably just creative and bizarre and grotesque but absolutely blew me away because just with the most simple format. It was a, play, a playwright and theatre practitioner called Caroline Horton, who is amazing. And just, she appears as this kind of grotesque figure and takes you on this journey about what is, what kind of like, what it could be like to be like a tax fraud oh. god. Oh, wow, okay. But Jimmy Carr. Yeah, <laughs> how, you, how you then just like, you know, piss all over the rest of humanity because you get to survive in your little island. Oh, it was great. Wow, it sounds awesome. Yeah. Um, what's been your... Um, your favourite experience on stage? Uh, on stage, I was in a play uh, at Finborough Theatre, it's another French theatre in London, with a play called The Fleurs of Edinburgh. Uh, I'm from Glasgow, I'm Scottish, and this play was written in Scots, the Scots language, oh. um, which was great and fun. But there was a scene where my character was trying to intimidate another character. Went on fine, tiny little space, but there was this big fat fly buzzing around the room and it's only a small theatre everyone could see it it was distracting us I think we'd had a couple of swipes at it but at one point in the scene it lands on the table in front of us and we both clock it I take a glass whack it down on the on the fly and I catch it and for the rest of the scene I'm just trying to intimidate this guy while referencing this little fly I've caught in front of me wow that's amazing and at the amazing. end of the scene I put it in my hand and just kind of open it up and it's still there and I crush it at the end of the scene and walk off and I'm like I'll never do anything that cool again wow that's amazing. As the audience were leaving, a little like a little uh, little pensioner on the way out turned to the usher and went, "How do you get the fly to do that?" <laughs> I, I saw that coming. <laughs> oh my 
god, that's you work so, so funny. hard and the fly gets the credit. Oh yeah, right. Well, good for the fly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> who is your favorite? Well, I don't know. We're kind of we're just coming out of lockdown, yeah. but. Uh, an up and coming actor yep. that you would like to recommend or talk oh. about? Oh, uh, just so many have come through in the last, like over the last 12 months with so much content that we've been uh, establishing. It's just been absolutely phenomenal uh, work that's just been going on. I'm trying to think of her name. Uh, uh, she's a Welsh actress called Morvid. And she was, a, I saw her on stage at the Soho Theatre in a verbatim piece about elderly care. Again, this is why theatre is also a great art, is because this is where we really do the best work. Yeah. But then I've seen her in, she was in um, uh, His Dark Materials as well. Um, she was also in the David Copperfield film that Armando Iannucci did, and she's just fantastic. Everything she does is just so detailed and rich and fascinating. I think she's amazing, but there've been so many performers coming through in the last 12 months that are just mm. amazing to watch. So lots of exciting stuff to look forward yeah. to. And lastly, thank you so much. Uh, what's next for you? What's next for me? Uh, currently I am working on uh, some voiceover projects which are yet to be officially announced and named, but again, we wait and we wait with bated breath yeah. to see when they do. <laughs> so depending on when this video comes out, we could have an announcement. But again, for me, it's then back to making the most out of this and building on this as we go. So fingers crossed something by something to announce by the end of the year let's wait and see thank you so much robert bradley um welcome to lltv <laughs> thank you very we much. love you i love you i'm sure lots more people are gonna be loving you in the future as well thank you so much thank you so much thanks for coming down